morning. You're invited to participate in the morning worship service of First United Methodist Church in downtown Fort Worth, Texas. Hi, I'm Tim Brewster, Senior Pastor of First United Methodist Church of Fort Worth. Welcome to this service of worship. I'm glad you've chosen to join us in this broadcast of our 11 o'clock worship service. And I hope you can join us in person at one of our services at 8.30 in the chapel, 9.30 in the sanctuary, 11 o'clock in the sanctuary, and at 11.11 in Wesley Hall. On behalf of the whole congregation of First United Methodist Church, I welcome you. You're better than some of us, but um, I particularly like the how to, how to eat anything you want, anytime you want, and never gain weight. Um, I, I'm going to be there at that one. Dealing with difficult people versus them dealing with you, or getting kids to get it, and raising cooperative, responsible, dependent, codependent, or excuse me, codependent, confident children. <laughs> that would no. I think he's going to teach you how not to do the codependent thing. You read it. You'll do better than I am right now. We also have a special program being sponsored by our United Methodist Men, and Tom Gardgrove is here. He's going to tell you a little bit more about letters from Dad. Good morning, everyone. Gentlemen, if I could have your attention just for the next uh, couple minutes here. Uh, for, the, for the past three weeks, we've been asking you guys a question, and the question is this, that if your Heavenly Father were to take you home today, what would your family have in their hands tomorrow that would remind them that they were the treasures of your life? Would your children, your grandchildren, and your great-grandchildren know how much you love them, how proud you were of them? Would they know what your hopes and dreams were for them? Would they even know the emotions and the excitement and the love that filled your heart the moment that you first laid eyes on them? And even your spouses, would they know the same thing? Would they know that you thought that they were the absolute finest mother that their children could ever have? <clears throat> your parents, your siblings, any other person in your life that you care deeply for, would they know these things the day after you're gone. I'm excited on behalf of the United Methodist Men to announce a new ministry that we're launching this fall called Letters from Dad. Letters from Dad is a ministry that teaches guys how to write letters. Real simple. Letters of love, letters of hope, letters in which we can share our dreams with our families, uh, letters that they can not only read when we're gone, but well into the future when we're long gone. We're very excited about this ministry. It's the first time that it's been brought to this church. And we hope all of you guys consider at least learning more about this ministry. Inside your bulletins is an insert that I'd like to have you guys fill out because we're going to have a kickoff next Sunday night at Wesley Hall at 7 o'clock. It's a kickoff barbecue. At the end of the service, we'll have baskets in the back and here in the front. Just drop them off so we can reserve a seat for you. And if there's anybody else that you know who you think may want to know more about this ministry, then bring them along and just indicate to us how many you plan on bringing. You know, I can, I can think of at least a couple of things that we have in common here this morning. Number one, we really don't know when our Heavenly Father is going to call us home. And number two, the fact that we all woke up this morning can pretty much remind us, guys, that we've been given another chance. 
another chance to make things right for our family for that day after our Father calls us home. I don't have to remind you that at some point in time, we're going to run out of chances. Fellas, don't let this opportunity go by. It's going to be an incredible journey. I personally cannot afford, nor do I want to take the chance to rely on somebody else after I'm gone to tell my family how much their father loved him and how much he loved his wife and to tell them about his hopes and his dreams for them. I can't take that chance. They're going to know from me, and they're going to know about it long after I'm gone, and I'm very excited about that. Our Heavenly Father took time out of His busy schedule to write to His family, us, the most beautiful love letter ever written. Gentlemen, don't you think that we could probably take a little time out of our schedule to do the same thing for our family? I hope to see every single one of you guys next Sunday night to at least learn more about this ministry because it will be an incredible journey, I promise. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Again, it is good to have each one of you here this morning. May God bless us now as we begin our worship together. Will you please stand? You be seated. And let us pray. O oh God, you are infinite, eternal, and merciful, glorious in holiness, full of love and compassion, abundant in grace and truth. 
All your works praise you in all places of your dominion, and your glory is revealed in Jesus Christ, our Savior. Therefore, we praise you, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Hola and buenos dias from the people of Costa Rica. For those of you who do not know where Costa Rica is, it's the first country north of Panama. It's uh, hot and humid, and I was discussing with my wife what I was going to say today, and I told her that I was going to tell you about the beauty that is Costa Rica and the 200 inches of rain they get a year and the rainforest and the waterfalls. And she says, no, you need to tell them about the mission. I said, but I was gonna tell them about the volcanoes and the small, the tiny little red frogs the size of your little fingernail that are poisonous. She said, no, you've gotta tell them about the mission. I said, well, what about the small alligator I saw in the Serapiki River? It's called Escala. And the people of Costa Rica, the beautiful people of Costa Rica, and the beautiful fellow mission trippers. She said, I told you to tell them about the mission. <laughs> and I said, well, can I tell them about how blessed we are with our bilingual minister, Chuck Graff? She said, would you please tell them about the mission? 
And being a person who listens to my wife, I thought, well, I guess I'll tell you about the mission. So imagine a hillside with a six post holding up a metal roof that's open all around and has two hours of morning services on Sunday, two hours of evening services on Sunday, and two hours of evening services on Thursday that I didn't understand any of them, but it had the most fantastic music. And above this steel-framed place is this uh, cinder block building that we're building. And so the first, um, hmm, do you remember what yesterday was like about two o'clock in the afternoon? Uh, that was our first day of work in the morning. And like that got worse all day long. It was really hot. Fortunately, God blessed us with a cloudier day, the second day and the third day, and he answered my prayers on the fourth day when he had it rain all day. <laughs> I will tell you, you have some wonderful people that love this church, who attended this mission trip, and spread your feelings amongst the Costa Rican people who love Chuck Graff. I was blessed to be able to go along this trip, and I was blessed to have the physical capacity <laughs> to withstand this trip. <laughs> Thank you very much for hearing me, and don't tell my wife. <laughs> the Hebrew scripture for today is Isaiah chapter 40, verse 11. Please read Isaiah with me. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arm and carry them close and shall gently lead those that are with young. God speaks to us through the reading of scripture. Thanks be to God. pictures here. My favorite picture of Jesus. Thank you. Of course, when Jesus lived, uh, there were no cameras. Come on in here, folks. Hi, Andrew. We need a lot of them. We need a lot of them? Okay, we got a lot of them. Here, Andrew. Thomas. Thomas. Here you go, Hoss. You may. Okay, does everybody have a picture now? Here you go. Now this picture is a drawing. Here's one down here. Thank you, Nathan. Now he's got one. Okay, thank you. These, uh, th this is a drawing of Jesus, and it's my favorite drawing of Jesus. Um, I wish your mothers and grandmothers and grandfathers and fathers could see it. Hold it up so they can see it. I, I'll tell you what this, I think this is when Jesus was talking to some children and the children said something really funny and he was really laughing about what, what uh, Jesus had said. And now listen, 
If he were here today, you know what he would be saying to you? He would be telling you how much he loved you. He is here. He is here, right. And he's telling us how much he loves boys and girls. Now look on the back of the picture and you'll see some words. Some of you are old enough to uh, read what it says, but I want us to sing that little song that's back there. Do you know that song? You know, well, you can, you know the song anyway. You know the song anyway. L listen to the song and you'll know it. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Well, you did know it. That's very good. Ah, you forgot that you knew it. Well, let's have a prayer. Okay. Heavenly Father, thank you for loving us. And thank you for sending Jesus to love us also. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you very much. And you may keep the pictures. Can I have another one? You may. shepherd I shall not want the Lord makes me lie down in green pastures leads me beside still waters restores my life leads me in right paths for the sake of the Lord's name even though I walk through the darkest valley I fear no evil for you are with me your rod and your staff they comfort me you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies you anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord as long as I live. the source of all goodness and beauty, all truth and love. We believe in Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh, our teacher, example, and redeemer, the savior of the world. We believe in the Holy Spirit, God present with us for guidance, for comfort, and for strength. 
We believe in the forgiveness of sins, in the life of love and prayer, and in grace equal to every need. We believe in the Word of God contained in the Old and New Testaments as a sufficient rule both of faith and of practice. We believe in the Church, those who are united in the living Lord with purpose of worship and service. We believe in the reign of God as the divine will realize in human society and in the family of God, where we are all brothers and sisters. We believe in the final triumph of righteousness and in the life everlasting. Amen. That is a truth into which we place our lives and our very being. So much so that even in times when we are beaten down, and in those times when we are going strong and feeling confident, we know the truth of your abiding love. Your compassion for us is genuine. Sometimes the gentle, soothing compassion of a parent holding their little one for comfort and reassurance. Sometimes that unknown source of strength that moves us one foot in front of the other until we feel ourselves stable again. It is we who abandon, not you. And even then you wait, you call, you work on behalf of what is good. How then do we respond to your love? Do you ask us to love others even when we don't feel it? Do you ask us to do what is right, not to promote our own self-righteousness, but to further the good, whether it be recognized or not? Would you have us be kind, reserve judgment, Give freely and happily of what needs sharing to be of any real value. Do you really trust to us the work of your heart? We ask then to know you, to follow Christ as our example, and to trust the spirit of love to act in and through us. And so, gracious God, forgive us as we act out of fear, Forgive us when we see others as less loved by you. Heal us from our desire for vengeance. Heal us from our hatreds. Heal us from our small-mindedness. Make us one with Christ 
as we, your church, your body, your hands and feet, we join to pray with one voice. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. A reading from the book of John, chapter 10, verses 11 through 18. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand, who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because a hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord, and I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father. God speaks to us through the reading of Scripture. Thanks, Thanks be to God.
is really wonderful to have our choir back from England. They walked and waded through some water in order to get here. It's also really nice to have them behind me. Last week we had no choir here. I'm not a great singer, but last week I didn't sing at all. Our youth are returning this afternoon about 3 o'clock from another mission trip in Costa Rica. And as Linda mentioned in her announcements at the beginning of the service, the youth will lead the worship service both at 9.30 and 11 next Sunday, and that will be a real treat for there won't be one preacher. There'll be two preachers each service, and their spirituality and the ways in which they have formed their life in God's presence will be a testimony and inspiration to all of us. The Bible means different things to you and me at different times, and the Bible doesn't change, so that means we do. My approach for most of my life has been historical critical, namely to try to understand the context of the, in which the text was written, the time it was written, the author who wrote it, and to whom it was addressed, and the meaning to its original hearers. Over the last year or so, my approach to reading the Bible has changed. I obviously still read the Bible and know of its historical context, but my task in reading each morning during my med time of meditation is to find one word or one phrase which will carry me for the day. Uh, one sentence that I remember from this past week was from one of the Psalms. God is addressing us and says, can you not even think of me for five minutes? And I think how much time we have in our day and how much of it is oriented around things that we plan to do and things we need to get done, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And how often do we pause to think and to put God at the center of our lives and God be the center around which all other things we do. This morning I want to think with you about the 23rd Psalm and the method that I wish to use is called Lectio Divina. You'll find it at the bottom of the worship service reading the Bible spiritually, lectio, which means to read the Bible and to remember and consider the metaphors that are in the text, meditatio, which is to meditate upon the scripture, remembering the context in which we find it, oratio is to pray the text, and contemplatio is to live the text. Let us take a look for a few minutes at the 23rd Psalm. There are three controlling metaphors in the 23rd Psalm. The first metaphor is that of the shepherd. The second meta metaphor is that of a Palestinian king in his tent with the flaps rolled up and a feast laid out before him. You lay out a meal before me in the presence of mine enemies. And the third metaphor is a metaphor of God's holiness in the temple. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord all my days. The Lord is my shepherd. Note how intimate the language of the psalm is. It is not that the Lord is our shepherd, but the Lord is my shepherd. A shepherd is a protector to protect us from the animals of the wild. And the task of the shepherd is to provide, to lead us into places of still waters. In Palestine, the sheep were not driven by jeep or horse or helicopter, the sheep were led. We had these very steep hillsides and on the sides of the hillside are these paths which are rocky and narrow. And so it was the task of the shepherd in this case to lead the sheep. I shall not want, I will lack nothing. You and I can be in the midst of abundance, we can have all sorts of things around us and we can still lack the one thing needed for us to have our souls satisfied. And we can be in the midst of almost nothing and still lack nothing at all because we are grounded in God's presence. Within the first two years of my becoming a minister at this church, I went to the hospital and visited a man. He had come in, it was after Christmas, his shoulder was hurting, he thought he had wrestled with his grandchildren improperly and had it dislocated and come to find out after some tests he had bone cancer and it was all through his body. And he said to me, Bill, I'm not worried about this. I've had a good long life. I'm not afraid to die. I trust God. And he talked about his death and the things that were before him openly. And as a result, 
People didn't have to walk on eggs or needles. People didn't have to avoid the subject. They were able to envelop him with their love and he was able to receive it and he died in peace. We can be in the middle of almost nothing and we lack nothing because we are grounded in God. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. No longer are these the small trails along the sides of the hillside. We are now at a place with lush meadow where the sheep have enough room to lie down. This is not the hillside. This is not the rocky paths. This is a lush meadow. He leads me beside still waters, not running waters, not streams, not dripping waters along the rocks of the side of the hills. It is still waters that he leads us. And he makes camp, is the Hebrew text. He makes a camp for me beside still waters. The tents are up, the flats are open, and the sheep lie in lush meadow. And I am filled. We are filled, we are filled with the presence of God as our protector and as our provider. He leads me in right paths, not wrong paths, right paths. Not dead end paths, not paths that lead to cliffs, not paths that lead to the den of some wolf. God leads us in right paths. Our son David and I have done some <clears throat> hiking in the course of our life and twice we decided to take a path of our own and get off the path. And in both cases, we came to a cliff and turned around. A third time, we lost our path. And around and around and around, David knew I was going to die. He knew he was going to have to carry me out. We saw three Indians on pack horses with pack horses following. None of them, they spoke no English. Anything I asked them about direction or where's the saddle, where can we get down? Not a single word. And so around and around and around we went till we got wet and cold and got a ride back to camp in the back of a pickup truck and froze to death. Not wrong paths, right paths. For his name's sake. For his name's sake because of who God is. God is goodness and God is mercy. Why does God lead us in right paths? Because God is God. Even though I walk through the darkest valley and the sides of this hillsides in Palestine come down so that at the bottom of some of these valleys it is almost dark all day long. And the shepherds have an agreement that in the morning the sheep go up the path and in the afternoon sheep come down the path because there's not room for the, for the sheep to cross. And there are places where the sheep have to be helped to cross jumps of 18 inches and 24 inches. Though I walk through the darkest valley, and it may be, yea, the darkest valley, the darkest time of our life. I fear no evil, for you are with me. I fear no evil, because you, O oh God, are with me. Notice again the intimacy of the language. It is not the language of us, it is the language of I, and the language for God is the language of you. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The rod is to protect us from animals that would feed upon the sheet, sheep. The staff is to catch them when they fall or to hold them back from going someplace they shouldn't. They comfort us because we are protected from our enemies and held in check by the shepherd. You prepare a table before me. This is the image of God as feast provider, as banquet giver, as party maker. An Arabian sheik, the flaps of the tent again are up and the feast is prepared as before us and it is on the table and God has fellowship with you and me. God prepares the meal and God comes to eat with us. In the presence of my enemies, internal enemies, impatience, anger, resentment, addiction, external enemies, those who would hurt us, 
God has fellowship with us in the presence of our enemies. 1983, I was told that I would not be recommended for tenure at the institution at which I taught. My teaching was ranked second or one of the two best in terms of student rating. I had written some publications, but not enough. It was a school that was attempting to upgrade itself in terms of national reputation, and my publications were not enough. The dean came down and said to me, Bill, it's just not there. Well, at first I was okay. I called Susan. I went home to walk. I was comforted by a line from Kierkegaard, the good does not demand immediate vindication, and of course I was the good. But in the long slug of the middle, things got tough. Susan had just returned from Boston with another hip surgery. The children were small. No school wanted a 44-year-old assistant professor. They wanted a 25-year-old instructor who would be happy to empty the wastebaskets. <clears throat> so I came down to the church and I said that I wanted to be a minister at this church and they held a position open for me for six months. And in June of 1984, I came to minister at this church. But in the meantime, I had had some visions of the dean. I went up to the faculty lounge, which was on the second floor. I grabbed him by his lapels. I threw him out the window. And <clears throat> beneath the window were these grates, you know, which, which let light into the basement. And they were somewhat sharp, but not too sharp. And they were rusty, and it was going to hurt all the way through. And sometimes when I would go to do a wedding at the chapel and walk through where I had been a professor, I slunk. I had my head down. This was Napoleon's Waterloo. This is where they had said, you're not good enough. But sometime, I don't know when it was, two years, three years, something changed. I walked in one afternoon to do a wedding rehearsal and I looked around and I thought to myself, look, I'm grading papers. I don't have to grade papers now. I can teach. I'm a pastor to people. These are things that are natural to me. Burr Rabbit just found the briar patch. So things had changed. A few years after I was at the church, the dean was in the hospital with high blood pressure and heart trouble, and I went by to see him. And as is my custom, had prayer before I left. Later, I learned that I was the only person that came to visit him in the hospital who had prayer with him. About five years ago, I was visiting one of our members in the hospital who was there for emergency bypass. And lo and behold, in the bed next to him was the dean, back in for high blood pressure and heart problems. And again, as was my custom, I had prayer with him as I left. Came back the next day to see our parishioner and saw him as well. And had some conversation and indicated that I had read one of the articles that he had read, that he'd written on Matthew's Gospel and had found it cited in one of the works that I was reading and he was pleased to know that and we had conversation. And as was my custom again, I closed with prayer. I turned to leave. He said, Bill, I love you. And I turned and I said, I love you too, Jack. Two days later, his daughter called me. He had died. They had misdiagnosed his condition. He had liver cancer. And he said, his daughter said, I knew he would want you to hear this from me. What if? What if we bring the enemy to the feast, the feast of God's love? What if we bring our anger our resentment, our addictions to the feast of God's love and they're baptized and we are born from above and in the course of feasting at the banquet of God's love, the enemy becomes the friend. You anoint my head with oil the shepherd, before the sheep enter the fold at the end of the day, a 
anoint the sheep with oil to heal the cuts and the bruises that have occurred in the day. Samuel anointed David with oil, made David royalty. You anoint my head with oil. You heal my cuts and bruises, and you make me royalty with your love. My cup overflows. At the end of the day, the sheep is watered to the fill, and as it puts its head in the bucket, the water overflows. How much love does God have for us? Let it fill our hearts. Let it overflow. And let it touch the people around us. Goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Not evil. Goodness and mercy pursue us. They follow us. They seek to influence us. They seek to make us people of love and goodness and mercy ourselves. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord all my life long. The house of the Lord is the place of the holiness of the presence of God, and you and I can live with the holiness and the presence of God every day of our lives. Sometime this week, find a quiet place. Is yours the morning? Is it the afternoon? Is it the evening? Read Psalm 22. It's a crucifixion psalm. Psalm 23, the shepherd, the feast, and the presence of God. Psalm 24 is a psalm of jubilation. Lift up your head, ye mighty gates. The people who put these psalms together did so for a reason. Try to read, if you can, this week, the 23rd Psalm in the context of the 22nd and the 24th. Now I would ask that we would join and pray the Psalm together. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The Lord makes me lie down in green pastures leads me beside still waters, restores my life, leads me in right paths for the sake of the Lord's name. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord as long as I live. Now let us live the song.
pray, gracious God, that these gifts we bring will somewhere, somehow, in these days ahead, feed some of your sheep. In Jesus' name, amen. Our hymn of invitation is number 352, and as we sing it, we invite to the chancel you who would join our church today. Let me tell you, at the first church, uh, Dick and Veda Holsinger became uh, members of our church family. And this is Megan Williams, who comes from another uh, denomination. And Jesse comes to renew his vows uh, of the Christian faith. And we're delighted that he has come. He's a part of our membership already. And we're delighted that he's come today. Uh, Megan, let me ask you, will you be faithful to the United Methodist Church and support it with your prayers, your presence, your gifts, and your service? Great. I'm, I'm going to ask you and Jesse to remain here at the chancel, and the people will come and welcome you and congratulate this guy on renewing his vows to Christ. God bless you. Thank you, Bill. Our gathering will soon be ended. Where will we go and what will we do? May grace, peace, love, and hope be with us all, both now and forevermore. Amen.